It's the party of the year, and you're invited. There'll be cake, presents, and demons. <laughs> Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're covering Lamberto Bava's Splatastic Demons 2. Released in 1986, just a year after the original Demons, Demons 2 tries to live up to its predecessor. With four screenwriters involved, including Dario Argento and Dardano Sacchetti, you might be thinking this entry should have a compelling plot. And you'd be wrong. Demons 2 is a mishmash of half-formed ideas that don't really go anywhere, narrative dead ends, and completely forgettable characters. But it does have the return of Bobby Rhodes and special effects work from Sergio Stivaletti and Rosario Prestepino. And hey, no one watches Italian horror films for the tightly woven narratives and deep character studies. They watch it for the insanity and the gore. Does Demons 2 deliver the splatter? Let's get to the gore and find out. The film opens with some narration basically just rehashing Demons 1. That prediction came true when spectators in a movie theater were transformed into bloodthirsty, fanged creatures. That's handy, I guess. Then we jump to this knife with blood dripping onto it. I like that Lamberto Bava's not messing around here. Oh <laughs> wait, it's just a bakery. You fooled me, Lamberto Bava. Shame on you. Apparently it's Sally's birthday, so happy birthday, I guess. We then jump to Italy's version of the Nakatomi Tower. Wait a minute, that security guard is Ripper from the original Demons. Good to see he kicked that coke habit and somehow survived being ripped apart by Hellspawn. Upstairs, this pregnant lady, Hannah, is stretching out while perusing a G-rated version of the Kama Sutra. Look, you're already pregnant. I don't think you need a guide at this point. This Italian Rob Lowe is her husband, George. And he has cable, not direct TV. This movie's already hopping around like a rabbit on meth. Oh shit, don't look now, but it's Bobby Rhodes. That's right, the badass pimp from Demons is back, as a totally different character. He's kind of like a tiny C.T. Fletcher, if we're being honest. Like any good personal trainer, he tells this dude to stop hack squatting and get in the rack like a man. Upstairs, Sally's party is kicking into high gear. And really, they should be partying because they're all going to be dead at some point in the next 15 minutes. While they're dancing at their wake, the birthday girl's fashionably late. It's because she's having a meltdown. Huh, <laughs> look, this dress makes me look like a total hellspawn. But then this spiffy demons documentary comes on the TV. That holds Just... the key to the demons. Who were they? Where did they come from? Can they happen again? We then meet some more demon fodder, except for this little girl. That's a very young Asia Argento making her big screen debut in a movie produced by her father. Anyway, this weird documentary is dumping some exposition on us. The demon outbreak was contained by building a wall around the city, apparently. Can it happen again? Will we be ready next time? What is being done to prevent it? Is a wall enough to keep an inhuman threat at bay? Hmm, that idea sounds strangely familiar. Guessing it will work out about as well in real life as it does in this movie. So, in the documentary, these dopes are going to climb the wall and break into the city. Because, sure, what could go wrong? Like most Italian horror films, Demons 2 is dubbed. And man, are there some terrible line readings. Like this one. Hello. No, Daddy isn't home. Sounds just like a real human child. I'm not a robot. Back in the other apartment, Hannah's husband is trying to make sense of the script. Well, at least he says what we're all thinking. It's useless. Do these people live in a neon sign factory or what? Back in the documentary, which is now just another part of this movie apparently, our lunkheads find a demon claw. Lead lunkhead then drops some exposition on us. They spread the contagion through their fingernails. Oh yeah? Then how come the first people to turn into demons in the previous movie got scratched by that weird mask? Back at Sally's party, the phone's ringing. It's producer Dario Argento. Hey, could you guys speed it up a bit? We're 15 minutes in and no one's died horribly. Time is money and all that. Then we jump over to this lady watching the demon documentary in her apartment. Come on, Lamberto Bava. I need a scorecard to keep all these people straight. Back in the documentary, this lady cuts herself. That seems ominous. After that, they creep along right into this jump scare. Damn radios. Then they discover this dead demon. My god, what is it? A demon. Yeah, thanks. I already told everyone what it was. There's no danger. Famous last words. Okay, everyone gather around. We need a selfie for Instagram. Don't look now, but the girl with the cut is dripping blood on that demon corpse. 
Oh yeah, I feel like something is finally about to happen. So, of course, this is the perfect time to cut back to Sally's awful party. What the hell, Lamberto Bava? Sally's checked out of her own party and is just basically Netflix and chillin' by herself watching this demons documentary in the other room. If you guessed the blood was gonna bring that demon back to life, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. Nice fake out on the demon fingernail. Really thought that was going somewhere. Fun fact, this effect was achieved by filming a melting wax mask in reverse. Sally watches while the demon gets down to business. No! No! I'll be honest, this is way more interesting than her party. Blood nurtures the dormant seed of evil. How can the demons be stopped? Hell if I know, look, this is the weirdest infotainment documentary ever. The demon comes back, and man, this show is really into breaking the fourth wall. Oh, it can't be! <laughs> Sally just sits there like a dope while the demon breaks through the screen. Hey, change the channel, dummy. She's locked in the room, but she gets over it all long enough to walk right into this jump scare. Now that that's over, who wants cake? You can't have birthday cake without the birthday girl, so they invite her back to her own party. And she looks totally normal. Huh, didn't see that coming. Sally might look normal, but she's clearly not feeling normal. She's super vascular. She probably borrowed some of Bobby Rhodes' pre-workout. Sally makes a wish and blows out the candles, and if that wish was to turn into some sort of hideous creature from hell, it looks like everything's coming up Millhouse. Damn it, I knew we should have gotten her a different color palette at Ulta. Puke green really isn't her shade. Probably should have gotten her a gift certificate for Invisalign, too. Those teeth need some work. As she transforms, everyone's dipping out like the cops just showed up and they're all underage. But surprise, the door's locked. With things just starting to get interesting, it's time to jump outside to a totally unrelated scene. Oh <laughs> look, that's director Lamberto Bava. If you think this is gonna lead somewhere, you're wrong. We never see these people again. Hey, remember George and Hannah? They're still in this movie. She's got a craving for cake, so she's gonna head over to the party and get some. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. She knocks on the door and rings the bell, but Sally's like, no present, no cake. Then, for some inexplicable reason, probably because one of the four writers on this movie saw Alien, Sally starts bleeding acid blood. Sure, let's just roll with it. While everyone's transforming into a demon, that blood is working its way through the building. This guy's getting a little blood shower, and now that he's infected, he decides he's feeling a little peckish, so he fries this chick in her giant George Foreman grill. Look at that, the fat just drains right off. After that, it's time for some driving. These guys are out here trying to find the plot. Spoiler alert, they never actually find it. Back inside, these two guys meet up to discuss the blood leak. I touched it. It burns. Yeah, I'd say you probably want to get those fingers looked at at the ER. After that, we check in with the dog. If he gets a flashback, I'm out. Then the dog's owner gives us some lazy exposition. The air conditioning is turned off. And in this stupid building, you can't open the windows. Double panes, bulletproof, they say. Convenient. Davy the dog isn't gonna get a flashback. He's just gonna turn into one of the dogs from the thing instead. I will say this transformation scene is pretty effective. Apparently turning into a demon also makes a dog sound like a jaguar or something. Then Fido here turns on his owner and treats her like a human chew toy. Mmm, <laughs> wet food. Don't look now, but the demons are taking the party on the road. And I guess this is as good a time as any to try and recreate that iconic shot from the original movie. And like everything else in Demons 2, it pales in comparison to its inspiration. George, who went to get cake, is trapped in the elevator with the hooker. And his very pregnant wife is all alone. If you guessed she was going to start having contractions, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. And really, they had four writers on this thing. What's a few more credits? If you're wondering where the demons are headed, they're in the gym. And they're definitely not fans of people curling in the squat rack. Then Bobby Rhodes shows up and is like, I'm a fan of fitness. Fitness barbell in your mouth. Then he's like, time for cardio, as he commands everyone to sprint for the exit. Let's get out of here! Let's get out of here! They get to the door, but it's locked, so Bobby Rhodes starts working on his new program, which involves a lot of barbell swings and some functional fitness with the plant toss. Then panic sets in. Hello? Hello? We're out of protein powder and bars! Bobby Rhodes is like, I ain't got time for your jibber-jabber. Everyone head for the garage! But first, he gives this dude a barbell beatdown. 
I'll teach you not to re-rack your weights. They all flee again, and damn, did they just wander into the underground fight scene from Lionheart? Not gonna lie, I'd pay to watch Bobby Rhodes and Van Damme fight to the death. While they're busy ripping apart these cars like they work in a chop shop, the latchkey kid has armed himself with a laser and is ready to face the demons. Santa? Is that you? Oh no, it's just the demons. He heads upstairs and back to Sally's apartment. Maybe there's some of that cake left. The kid gets spooked, but now the phone's ringing. <laughs> Wait a minute, the phones weren't working earlier. How are they suddenly working now? Anyway, he hides in this service area and Sally doesn't spot him. But there is blood dripping on him. Is that demon blood? Place your bets now. We then jump to this random couple in a train station. Well, sure. This movie already has 800 inconsequential characters. What's two more? Turns out these are Latchkey Kid's parents. Back at the elevator, Ripper's gonna help George and the prostitute get free. <laughs> Except Sally has other plans. <laughs> Back down in the parking garage, Bobby Rhodes and company have started a fire. And really, is this a good idea? You guys can't get out of the building. This wall of flame can't stop these ninja demons anyway. They just show Kasugi their way right in. But Bobby Rhodes isn't putting up with any home invasions. He's mounting a stand your ground defense and takes them out with the shotgun. And if you hadn't had enough pointless scenes of driving around yet, you're in luck. Because now we're going for a ride with the latchkey kid's parents. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to feel like Demons 2 might be a little padded. Remember that dude trying to help them get out of the elevator? Well, he's not gonna let a thing like death stand in the way of being a good Samaritan. He resurrects as a demon and grabs the hooker by the hair. I just have to know what shampoo you use. Your hair smells amazing. Then we jump back to the basement. I swear to God, this movie's gonna give me whiplash with all the jumping around. After that, we get a real case of whiplash as two of our movie's subplots collide. Oh man, you guys were so close to making it into the main plot, too. <laughs> Back inside, the latchkey kid pays a visit to Hannah. I think we can all guess where this is headed. Yeah, that kid's a demon. No screenwriter's credit on that one because it was obvious. Fun fact, the demon child here is played by the same dwarf actor who played the murderous mutant in Dario Argento's Phenomena. Dude's the pushiest Jehovah's Witness ever. I said no, I will not take your copy of Watchtower. The demon finally forces his way in and starts chasing her through the apartment. But then he has this seizure, and basically recreates the chestburster scene from Alien. Man, those enchiladas were hard on my stomach. I'm about to give birth to a food baby, and it's gonna be a C-section delivery. Yeah, little dude just gave birth to a puppet. <laughs> Weirdest episode of Sesame Street ever. So, if the power's out in the building, how come her neon signs still work? Nothing in this movie makes sense. The puppet starts to give chase, and if you ever wonder what an Italian knockoff version of Gremlins would have looked like, I think you have your answer. Don't look now, but Asia Argento's mom is turning into a demon down in the parking garage. Help me, please. Bobby Rhodes is like, there's only one way to deal with a demon, and gives her both barrels. Back upstairs, Hannah throws a towel on the demon puppet and then hides in the closet. Nice plan, Hannah. I'm sure this will work out fine. She manages to escape the closet, but those pesky contractions are kicking in again. Because of course they are. <laughs> Damn, this is the Michael Jordan of puppets. That thing basically just dunked from the three-point line. And after all that, she basically traps it in the wall like his name was Amontillado. Back in the elevator, George has climbed out the top. And surprise, the hooker's now a demon. I feel like we're playing pretty fast and loose with the demon transformation rules and timetables at this point. George takes off. Thank God Coach made us do the rope climbing gym class. But he's got company. It's a race to the top. He wins, but only because he cheats and kicks the hooker demon in the face. If you thought that demon in the apartment was actually done when she trapped it in the wall, guess again. He's eating his way out through the drywall. Hannah grabs some scissors and gives this guy a trim. Then she douses him with this conveniently placed bottle of acid. Um, why is there a bottle of acid just sitting out in the kitchen? They're physicists, not chemists. Meanwhile, Italian John McClane tries not to get crushed by the elevator that is now somehow moving even though there's no electricity. I feel like this movie's not even trying anymore. He makes it out, but surprise, Hooker Demon is still here. Hey, how does this feel? Oh, it's great. Back in the apartment, Hannah surveys the damage. Too bad she doesn't see this jump scare coming. You didn't really think that puppet was dead, did you? Things look bleak for Hannah, but don't worry, George is here to save the day. 
He's like, I got you covered, honey, as he impales the puppet on an umbrella. Man, they're really trashing this apartment. I'm not sure they're getting their security deposit back. This seems like a good time to return to the basement, where we're about to reenact the Battle of Winterfell. Bobby Rhodes is laying a smackdown on this demon, but then the tables turn. This thing's really got him by the balls. Bobby's 0 for 2 in surviving demons movies. This guy's an environmentalist, so he offers to drive carpool for this batch of demons. Way to think of the planet. While that's going on, Asia Argento's dad is kicking ass, but he eventually goes down swinging as they swarm him. George and Hannah are going to escape to the roof, but first he's got to slow the demons down. George's bright idea is to basically rig the whole building to blow like the roof of Nakatomi Plaza. If you're still alive downstairs, oh well, sucks to be you. I'm not gonna lie, that's a pretty underwhelming explosion. I've seen bigger explosions when guys light their own farts. No way this killed all those demons. George rushes back to Hannah, who's found two other survivors. Great, more demon fodder. Of course Hannah's having cramps on the way up to the roof. Is she gonna have a demon baby? Place your bets now. Please wager responsibly. They wander right into another jump scare, and George is like, I gotta ask you something. Can demons fly? Looks like the answer is no. They make it to the roof and are about to rappel down, because of course they are. But first, we have to toss this demon manic into her death. If you're wondering how they know how to rappel down the side of a building, don't worry. The movie has you covered. You remember the rescue courses last summer? It's exactly the same thing. Oh, well that makes this totally plausible now. They're about to go over, but Sally's like, wait, you can't leave my party without saying goodbye. Seriously, guys, you forgot your gift bag. She hits the ground, but George is also clearly a plumber because he's putting in some pipe. After that, they wind up in the weirdest TV studio ever. Yeah, I think this might be where they shot Videodrome. I'm no obstetrician, but I think Hannah's about ready to pop. The good news is they can film the birth and maybe even add some cool After Effects stuff when they're done. While she's going into labor, this seems like a great time for some meaningless establishing shots of the city. Aw, it's a boy. Looks amazingly clean for just being born, too. If you guessed it was going to be a demon, pay up. Hannah sends George off for water, but look out, Sally's back. I know you wanted me to stick around back there, but I wanted to be the first to congratulate you on the birth of your son. She can't see. She's blind! Um, okay. I'm beyond the point of trying to figure out why anything happens in Demons 2. She's blind. Let's just go with that. Then she dies. I'm <laughs> glad she came back for that. It's over. Oh, you're not full of me, George. I've seen enough horror movies to know we've got at least one more scare coming. Sally may be dead here, but in TV land, she's still alive. Somehow. And making a break for it. George goes all Bobby Rhodes from the original movie and smashes everything. After that, they head into a brave new world. Hey, settle down, you two. That's how she got knocked up in the first place. Hey, what about Asia Argento? Man, Lamberto Bava ain't got time for that. He hit the 90-minute mark, and he's out. Figure that out in a sequel or something. So, Demons 2 isn't nearly as good as the film that inspired it. The sequel was a rushed production, and it shows. And while they had both Sergio Stivaletti and Rosario Prestepino on board for special effects duty, the carnage was toned down to get a better rating. Will that cost this one on the gore card? Let's find out. In terms of gross anatomy, Demons 2 offers up countless demon transformations, lots of ripped flesh, a human panini, one gruesome castration, one goofy demon puppet, and a demon impaled on a pole. This film feels pretty tame compared to the original, but Stivaletti and Prestepino's work is impressive enough even if it is fairly restrained. Because of that, I'm giving Demons 2 three barf bags out of five. Nothing here is as good as the original, but you can still have fun with it. Want more Demons action? Then be sure to check out my review of the original Demons, a better film in every way. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.